Today we'll be talking about dirt. Not just any dirt, but the dirt used in infields and baseball parks throughout the country. And not just any baseball park, but major league baseball parks. And that company is called DuraEdge, and it's right here in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Let's talk with their president, Grant McKnight, to find out how all this started. Well, Grant, what's so special about this soil? Well, Larry, you know, when we got far started doing the process of, of making engineered infield soils, we didn't know there was anything special about it. I, I was approached in 2000, 2001 time frame when I was at a trade show selling some golf course products and uh, a gentleman had come up and said, you know, hey, Pittsburgh could use a real good infield mix. And I said, you know, he's not really, didn't have a good material down there. A lot of people, he called on a lot of high schools and he said, if you can find a good infield mix and if it can be somewhat in the, in the shade of red, uh, I think you could do pretty well with it. So I thought, okay, I never played baseball when I was growing up. I, I was a swimmer and uh, so I didn't know the first thing about baseball dirt. I mean, literally nothing. Uh, I, I had to start from ground zero, but uh, you know, I knew I wanted to be in youth sports. I knew that my career path, I wanted to, to work in, in a business that had was a little less commodity. I was in a, a heavily commoditized business in the sand and gravel business for a number of years. And I just wanted to, to do something different. And I had been selling some golf products and I understood how to make the sand uh, for golf courses. And uh, so when I went into trying to make infield soil, uh, I went to Major League Baseball's website, expecting to be able to find some recipe or formula or, hey, this is what we think you should have, and it just didn't exist. You mean tell me that all the Major League ballparks did things just on their own? There was no, no standard for the industry? There was no standard that I could see. Um, there were a couple of manufacturers of products that were more widely used than others, but all in all, um, that was my, where I had to start first, was I had to figure out, okay, what, what were people using? And then I went out into the, to the field, literally, um, here in around Western Pennsylvania, and I went out in search of red clay. Now, Grant, let's go back a little bit. Obviously, something was missing, something was lacking in the infields in Major League Baseball. What was the problem that had to be solved? Well, most of the problem around Major League Baseball centers around moisture management of the, of the field surface, okay? Um, how does the field take a rain event? Uh, Major League Baseball and, and, you know, is driven by dollars, and there's huge money in the TV contracts, they need to get the games in. They have to play the games. And, and so rainouts cost teams very, very dearly. Uh, I, I typically will say, you know, every game in Major League Baseball is worth a million dollars to that team. And they don't generally bat an eyelash at it. The way the spring's been with the weather, it's probably not quite that in, in and around uh, in, the, in the north right now because you're not having as many people come. But, you know, moisture management is the key. So what, what we found very quickly when we started using this clay was is that the ability for this, for the groundskeeper to be able to manage the moisture in the infield was greatly improved. We, we, we like to call it a window with which the, you know, the, the material will perform nicely. And so if your window is very narrow, that means that your performance is a little lacking on the front beginning of the game, maybe at the, at the back side of the game. But we like to try and keep a window for all nine innings, a consistent playing surface for nine innings. That's our goal. Now, with all the Major League Baseball teams, how many teams are there? There's 30. 30 baseball teams. Wouldn't one of them been doing it better than the others, and wouldn't that be a model for the rest of them? Yeah. You always had the best infields in Southern California. So the players just generally knew that Los Angeles, San Diego had really nice infield clay. Uh, everybody just attributed it to the beautiful weather in San Diego and, and Southern California. That's why their infields were better. 
I've done enough testing now to know that the native clays in Southern California are pretty good. They are probably the closest to what it is that we're doing with our standard right out, of the, right out of the gate. So I think it was a combination of the weather and a combination of, they had some pretty good products to work with. But consistently across the country, it's very difficult to find a product that will perform at the, at the level that it needs to perform. But this was not natural clay. You had to somehow formulate it with something else? Yeah, well, the clay itself that we mine is just a naturally occurring mineral in, in the ground. In, the, in Western Pennsylvania, yes. Uh, and it's a naturally occurring mineral, but when we process the clay, as I said in the beginning, it's very high in clay content. By itself, it really can't be used. It needs to be mixed with sand at a certain rate to be able to get the stability out of it so that it will take the wa water and you can make the surface. Okay, you came up with this formula you thought was gonna work, you tested it out, you, when it rained, you saw what happened to it, and you went through the laboratories that you, that you work with and found out this should be the right thing. Now, where did you test it out to make sure that in a baseball game, this would be the right soil? Well, the product was built around the Jack Critchfield Park in, in, uh, at Slippery Rock University when uh, the university baseball park. yeah the university baseball park was where we first made the product so we didn't make the product first for major league baseball we made it first for college baseball slippery rock university um, that was where i really when i was approached to make that product and and start to produce the material, I went to Major League Baseball's website to find out how to do it. And that was what sort of triggered all of this work in professional baseball. Because, you know, in order to develop something new in the marketplace, you need to be working with people who understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So I approached the problems that these guys were having with their infield skin surfaces from a scientific perspective. Let's go back a little bit. Why did Slippery Rock come to you, or how did you get, get connected with Slippery Rock? And because, after all, you, you still hadn't had a proven formula. No. Why would they even be interested in talking? Well, it was a tough sell. I, you know, it, they, were, they had a nice donation from Mr. Critchfield, and I remember very distinctly having a difficult time getting the product to be able to be used. And, um, you know, ultimately I was working, I'm born and raised in Slippery Rock. I, you know, my, my parents, my mother went to Slippery Rock University. Uh, you know, we're, we've known a lot of people at the university. And so it was really the perfect place for something like that to happen. I can't say that it probably would have happened anywhere but Slippery Rock. So you install the infield at Slippery Rock University's baseball park. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did it take you to realize that what you did was all right? Well, we got immediate feedback, uh, you know, so when I, when I took the project at Slippery Rock, I was in the sand and gravel business. I was working with my father in construction materials. We, this was, a, the, this business, I had really no dreams of this going anywhere at this point in time. I kind of figured that I would make one field and that would probably be the end of it. But in order to get it to Slippery Rock and, and, and I had to promise them then give them a warranty and promise them that it would perform. And if it didn't perform, it was going to be at my cost to have to take it out and put in something that they liked. So I took a big risk. I, it, was a, it was a significant risk to, to say, and that, that's ultimately, they had zero risk in trying it because I was going to be on the hook to, to put them in a new infield if it totally failed. But we had no idea whether it was going to perform at, you know, well or be a failure. I just had no idea, but I, I felt we had made enough test samples of it to say this was worth giving it a try. And uh, so when we, after we installed the product, then, you know, we just monitored it. I went to every game. I uh, went when it was raining. I was really nervous. I can remember driving up to the ballpark thinking, is this going to be the day they tell me <laughs> it's just going to cost me 20 grand and I have to go talk, go talk to my father. When you put this special soil down, how deep does it go? Uh, anywhere between four and six inches is what it started out as. We make an engineered product and just like the, you know, an asphalt roadway, it, you can, the more you engineer the surface to perform, the thinner you can put it down. We're now putting down two inch lifts and that's really helped our business grow because you don't need as much of this product. That was, the, the standard was four to six inches everywhere 
and and now we're down as low as two in most of our installations. It's so good, you don't need as much. Of it. You don't need as much, and that's what helps people be able to afford it. Uh, okay. Okay, so your, your gamble paid off, your investment paid off, you put the field down, apparently it rained enough to prove that the, the, the it would work. content worked. How did you get the Philadelphia Phillies as your first major league team? Um, so the groundskeeping industry, uh, the, the turf industry, the groundskeepers themselves are a very tight-knit bunch. It's a very, very small group, uh, really more like a fraternity of people that take care of, of professional stadiums. Um, one of the uh, assistant groundskeepers that used to work for the Philadelphia Phillies head groundskeeper was the first professional installation in Lake County, in uh, Lake County Captains in, uh, I guess it's Euclid, Ohio. Uh, that was the first professional baseball team to put it in. It was a single A affiliate of the Indians, I believe at the time. And that groundskeeper worked for the head groundskeeper at the, the Phillies. And when they were building Citizens Bank Park, he said, you should look at this clay. This stuff works pretty well. He was having a lot of success with it. That's really where I learned a lot about the product. I mean, it worked at Slippery Rock, but I wasn't working with any professional groundskeepers. What ended up happening was the Philadelphia Phillies did not choose us for their initial opening of, of Citizens Bank Park due to the fact that we were not, did not have any previous traction in Major League Baseball. And that was fine. They went with a product that they felt, you know, was they were more comfortable with at the time, but they brought that product up from Alabama and imported it from a different climate. They struggled with it a little bit. It, the, the field wasn't performing a couple of years into the, the, the uh, use of the new ballpark. It, the infield wasn't performing. And so the head groundskeeper, Mike Bookholder, called me and said, I want to make some changes to the infield and I'm hearing good things about your clay. I just want to take the straight clay and mix it into the infield that I currently have. I thought, well, that sounds a little weird, but you know, I mean, let's, I guess we can try anything once. I mean, what I just was, I had no idea what would happen. So that process that we, we did there, we've eventually ended up calling it field saver. And that was the beginning of our, of our amendment process. And really the, the, the process that started putting us on the map is someone who could actually fix a poor performing infield. So what actually did it do? What was the result on a rainy season or a yeah. dry season? What were, what were the results that were measured where the feedback told you you may have had it right? So the players notice the way the infield plays. The infielders notice the way the ball bounces. That's really the most, from a player's perspective, that's what they see. They see how the, the performance of the, of the surface, how the ball stays down for them so they can field the ball. So they were having trouble. The infield was getting too dry, having a tough time holding moisture. The window was a little narrow for, for the area, the, the climate that they were in. So what we tried, what our, our hypothesis was, is that if we changed the silt to clay ratio inside of the mix, then we would be able to handle more moisture. And almost immediately, the next day, he saw in a difference in how the infield played when he watered it. Because there's a tremendous amount of water put on an infield surface in professional baseball. So he saw a difference immediately. The players came out from the first, we did it at the All-Star break in 2005, and the players came back and they uh, saw an immediate, an immediate change in how the infield played. And it, that's always been what's unique about what we do. And why, what I love about it the most is it helps the player and it helps the groundskeeper. So many times things that the players want are very difficult for the guy who has to take care of it to, to, to manage, to obtain, to manage. It's very difficult. In this case, every time it's a win-win. The player's happy and, the, and it creates less work for the groundskeeper. Um, that's, been, that's what kept me going in the business. Now that's under normal conditions in Philadelphia where they were watering the field every day. They were watering it just before the game and right after the game. What about when it rained? When was the first test when that happened? Well, I mean, the one that everybody remembers is in 2008 in the World Series. 
uh, when it really started to rain hard in game five of the 2008 World Series. Uh, and BJ Upton, I believe, was on first base and I was lying in bed and, and my wife said, can you shut the TV off? And I'm like, no, honey, this is our product and this is unbelievable. I'd never seen it rain like that. And, uh, and you know, the, the announcers, you know, the commentators were saying, you know, boy, this really is going to neutralize his speed. This infield's going to go and turn all sloppy. And, and uh, at that point, he uh, stole second base and then scored to tie the game on a routine single and in a driving rainstorm. And at, it was at that point that the infield didn't fail. And they actually, they, they held off the game. They, they, they did not play, they were supposed to play game six the next day. They held off the game because they thought the infield wouldn't be ready to play on. But I talked to the groundskeeper, Mike, the next day and he said, we could have played that night. And it, you know, that was where people started to realize that this clay does something unique that they haven't seen before. So the word got around through this fraternity of groundskeepers around Major League Baseball. And when did the others start saying, hey, wait a minute, now let's call these people and see if we can do the same thing? Yeah, well, we had done the New York Mets second. In 2006, um, we did an amendment at Old Shea Stadium. An amendment. An amendment process, the field savering process. We amended their their current infield. The, the Mets were building a new, were building City Field at the time, or just getting started to do it. And they had hired a new groundskeeper. And he called me and he said, "This infield's just not good." And he came from San Diego, so he had a pretty good infield. He kind of knew what was going on. His name is Bill Deacon, and and he's, you know, really widely known as you know one of the best uh, that's out there now. He's really doing it really good proponent of the science behind the soil and and he's been somebody that I've worked with very very closely but we we did so we did the mats um, in 2006 and then like I said and it, there was a there was a bit of a window there I would say in 2008 the Pirates I believe did theirs the first for the first time and but it was that World Series when I went out to San Francisco and talked with the team the Giants and and we were in a meeting and, and they said, well, how does this stuff take water? And I said, well, all you need to do is look at the World Series last year and they'll tell you. And um, the manager of the team was there and the assistant, uh, his assistant, and that's all they needed to hear. And, and so, you know, they, they saw it, they, they could see it, you know, perform and the way we went. So we were putting one into to San Francisco and it's just kind of gone in that exact way as, as people realized the players started talking about the differences in the infield um, and it just went on and on from there. Now, did you uh, put your infield soil in PNC Park when they first opened? No, we weren't making infield soil at that point. Uh, it, we, were not, uh, we, weren't, we weren't in the business as it were. I mean, I tried to get some root zones and things like that for the stadium, but we were very, very young in the, in the business. I didn't have really a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of credibility behind me, so you know I didn't get a, I didn't get anything at the at PNC Park when it first opened. But uh, you know the the infield we put the infield in the first time when it was replaced, and I believe it was 2008. Now there seems to be in my mind a point of no return because if you do all of the Major League Baseball parks, where else is there for you to go in your business? Well, I mean. What's ended up happening with professional baseball is <clears throat> we have a lot of teams now standardizing their playing surface. Um, they're evaluating talent for you know contracts, millions of dollars in in player contracts. So uh, you know I kept saying to them, why would you why would you evaluate someone if your surfaces aren't standardized across the board? So the first place we went after we started working in Major League Baseball with some of their affiliates. Um, so your, your AAA team, uh, the, say the, the Altoona Curve is the AA team. The, Indiana, the Indianapolis Indians in Indiana are the AAA of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So those, those two teams both have our surface. So as they're developing talent up the line, they're, they're playing on the same infield surface the whole way through. And so I worked on a lot of spring training facilities. I worked on a lot of the minor league affiliates and then real colleges and right down to your local little leagues. So that surface will work in any climate in the country? Yeah, it has proven to be able uh, to be used very consistently in indoor stadiums. Uh, we did the Rogers Center in, in uh, uh, 
Toronto when they put a full infield into Toronto. So we're in dome stadiums in, in uh, Milwaukee and Miami. Uh, and then, of course, we're in some of the harshest climates in New England and Boston, Fenway Park. Uh, you know, so we, we have really, really proven to be able to, the, the clay is proven to work in high desert climates as well in Southern California. So uh, high desert climates in Southern California. So that's, uh, it, it's been really performed well across the country. Let's see now. I'm, I'm a baseball watcher. I go to some games in Pittsburgh and watch baseball games no matter where they're played because we're baseball fans. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, and tell me if this is an incorrect analysis, that I see fewer tarps being put down on baseball fields when it rains. Well, I, I, I'm sure the groundskeepers would love to believe that they, uh, that they don't have to pull it because that's absolutely the job that they hate the most. Uh, I've gotten the, the privilege of pulling a few tarps at the All-Star Game um, when I have been, out, been fortunate enough to be on the cruise for the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. But there is definitely less concern with pulling the tarp. Uh, if you're down to hours before the game is going to be played, the tarp will get pulled. It depends on how much rain you're going to get, how hard it's going to rain. Actually, the harder it rains, the better off you are because the surface is so compacted that it will just sheet off. We put them on a grade so that the water will run off of the, uh, off the surface. Where does the water go? Out into the grass. So we'll pitch all of the, all of the one of the things that's made our product, it's proven now down um, 10 years later and why it's called DuraEdge. Um, Major League Baseball groundskeepers actually named it. I, I just called it classic infield mix when I first started. And, and once I realized that this was actually gonna be someplace that I went, I sat down at a trade show with a couple of guys and, and bought them a pitcher of beer and said, uh, it looks like we're gonna have to name this stuff now. And, and, and you know, so we just started picking up names. Baseball fields are defined by their edge the transition zone between the dirt and the grass. If you're a groundskeeper in a baseball stadium, that's really what defines how good your field is. And, and we talked about the surface being durable, meaning it would stay in place when you get a hard rain and a lot of wind. And we talked about how it would hold an edge. And so how Dura Edge was born was, uh, was over a bunch of guys who used the product and they named it for me. When you started in 2001 with Dura Edge, and of course it wasn't even named that in those days, uh, you probably had just a few employees, maybe just yourself doing everything. Tell us about the growth, how far you've come and where you have locations. I know it's not just here in Grove City now. Yeah, no, the, it's, it's not. Uh, and that's been the part that I've, I tell people a lot of times now, if you would have told me 15 years ago that I was going to be in Seattle, putting in an infield for the Seattle Mariners, I'd have told you you were crazy. But, uh, you know, we've, we've, it's been a great ride. Uh, we started off very small, like I said, for Slippery Rock University. I, I, there was no guarantee I was ever gonna make another pound of this stuff again. And, and I, quite frankly, I thought there was probably a better possibility I'd have to buy somebody else's product to replace Slippery Rock, which never happened. Uh, I'm gl obviously glad to say. But the, the business has evolved and as more demand, as the word of mouth has spread for the product, we've kind of had to follow that. And, and it's difficult from time to time. We have 14 locations now around the country. We're gonna be adding a couple more this year, I would say. Um, we have six salespeople and you know, probably in the neighborhood of 40 employees now, all in different parts of the country. Uh, we work with a lot of distributors as well. So the business has really grown on a, on a, to a national scale. Grant, this is fascinating. Yeah. This has been a fascinating story, how you came from a guy who was in the gravel business with your family to building a major, a major international business. And uh, in, in two thirds of the Major League Baseball parks right now with this special Dura Edge. And I appreciate your inviting us out here to Grove City because it was a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for the information. Thanks for having me, Larry. And uh, thanks for what you're doing for baseball. Thank you very much, appreciate it. 
So we just heard from Grant McKnight, the president of DuraEdge, about the infield side of baseball stadiums. What about the grass side? Who takes care of the grass and who makes the grass look as nice as it does on television or when we go to a ballpark? We're at Ready Green Turf Farms here just outside of Evans City here in Butler County, and Stuart Thompson is the guy that runs things out here. Now, uh, when you provide grass for a ballpark, let's say the wild things down in Washington, Pennsylvania, do you do the whole field? Uh, at one point we did, uh, lately we have not, mostly we just do the repair work anymore. Um, doing the arch around the outside edges, um, uh, along the ball, uh, base pads, things like that. Uh, where, where, or where the players stand a lot, there, there's areas that get wore out. So we'll, uh, try to match your sod or grass, grass up as best we can. So you have sod. You grow sod out here. I know you've got about 100 acres, and a lot of that is on the frontage here on Route 68. We can see that as we drive by. How do you start making sod? Uh, you start by planting grass seed just like anybody else would. Um, there's there's a little little, little uh, science involved in it. You have uh, certain timing, uh, best time of the year to seed, best time of the year to fertilize. Um, so we'll do that. Um, st- and grow it for, you know, however long, probably 18 months to two years before it's ready to cut for sod. And, um, then we'll match up for what the customer wants. Now, I know you do business all the way up from Erie all the way down to Morgantown, West Virginia, in this western strip of western Pennsylvania. And I know you've done a number of high schools. Do you put the same kind of sod in most high school ballparks? Um, no. Some ball fields are all you know, like a straight bluegrass field. Um, some have a blue rye mix, uh, depending on the, the nature of the, it depends on how they've maintained it and whether, whether they've, uh, seeded it originally or if it was sodded originally. So we'll try to match, uh, the field up as best. So there isn't like color differences and, um, texture differences in it. Now, I understand that you've been working in the movie business with your sod? Yeah, we do a lot of um, movies. Uh, the Pittsburgh area now is, is big on the movies, so they'll come in. They'll ask me for, you know, certain varieties, uh, like even some odd things like some real tall grass or some brown grass or weedy stuff, which I don't intentionally grow, but uh, we'll, we'll go match it up around the farm uh, I'll find some areas I've cut my own yard out of my, (laughs) so uh, just to match it up. And uh, so that makes it look pretty good too, but they'll, they'll send me pictures or they'll ask me, you know, to, to make a different variety or something, something special and we'll cut it for them. And it's exciting about the movie business or the TV business you're involved with. What are some of the productions you've worked on recently? Um, We've done, the uh, Netflix uh, series Mindhunter, and we're currently under working with uh, CBS for a uh, miniseries or series coming up. Now you do ballparks and football stadiums and 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 golf courses as well. Are golf courses difficult to take care of? Um, the golf courses are basically the same thing. They do a lot of repair work on them. Uh, we'll do, uh, you know. I guess as their areas get beat up or if they changing the bunkers or tees and things like that, we'll, we'll repair them or send the sod out for them to repair. Um, no, the, the golf course is the same as a, same as it would for a homeowner. It's very easy. It's simple. So you do homes as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we do, um, majority of our businesses for homeowners at, at this point. Why would a homeowner buy sod rather than just uh, planting the seed themselves? Instant instant gratification. Um, you could put the sod down, and uh, within you know seven to ten days, you're back out and using it. So you're out of the mud. Um, so a lot for people with homes that have dogs, and um, you know it, it's it's cleaner, it's easier around a swimming pool, whatever you're building. Uh, you put the sod down and. Uh, Like I said, instant gratification. Thanks a lot, Stuart. All right, thank you. So there we have it, uh, two organizations that take care of baseball fields and sports venues around western Pennsylvania. I'm Larry Berg. We'll see you next time on Faces and Places. (laughs) 